This is Radio EcoShock. With Do we really know how far the ocean will move inland because of global warming? Did you know key cities are sinking faster than seas rise? We have more immediate threats like COVID-19 variants and listeners are losing their jobs. Should we care? I think if you keep listening, you'll find out we should. We return to the expert who advises governments around the world, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and multiple other projects. Robert J. Nichols is the director of the UK's Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, and he's the chair of climate adaptation at the University of East Anglia. Dr. Robert Nichols, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Well, thank you for having me. According to Columbia University's Earth Institute, by 2025, about 35% of humans will live within 60 miles of the coast. Why should the rest of the people living inland stay tuned to our discussion about rising seas? Well, I think um, the the effects of um, sea level are kind of felt everywhere indirectly. I mean, uh, I think most people living inland often go to the coast for their holidays that, on a sort of simple uh, uh, sort of basis. But also, if, there are, if there's problems at the coast, I mean, we have huge amounts of population located there, um, then that will have effects on the economy inland. So it, it's really, even though it's happening in a specific geographic place, the consequences have global ramifications. I'm reminded of flooding in Thailand in 2011. That sounds far away, but it turns out most of the factories making the world's hard drives were located there. Western Digital lost about 60% of their production. Prices went up. It took more than a year to recover. Why are we all so tied together, and especially to areas in Asia that are prone to flooding? Why Asia? Well, I think Asia um, is uh, very flood prone in the coastal regions because we have very large numbers of extensive and populated deltas. So sort of more than 70 percent of the world's coastal population is located in South, Southeast and East Asia. So it's really the hot spot for human exposure to sort of to sea level rise and coastal hazards in general, and those areas, the economies are growing very fast, so they've become, over the last 30 years, real key hubs in the, in, in the world economy as well. I interviewed the veteran diplomat David Brown about the salty water going under and over the Mekong Delta, one of the world's biggest rice exporters. What happens when these fertile deltas in Vietnam and Bangladesh go salty and then go under because of climate change? Well, the... Um, Certainly, the uh, salt water um, has been penetrating into these deltas because of sea level rise, and that really has a big effect on the productivity of, um, of rice and all agricultural crops. So that is something of concern. I think it's also interesting that they're finding actually in the Mekong that um, salt water is penetrating into the delta not because of sea level rise, but actually because... They're dredging so much sand out of the Mekong that the river's getting deeper, and that actually affects the tidal wave. So the salt is going further inland. So, so, so in these areas, it's partly sea level rise, but there are other things going on too. And, but, they're, but they're having the same, the same net effect I mean, of, of impacts. Well, that's a big thing in your new paper, that humans are changing the planet, sometimes inadvertently, a, a bit at a time. And it's a lot more than climate change that changes how far the sea comes up on us. What is one of the other major factors that we're finding when it comes to the world cities? Well, it's, it's subsidence, really. The, um, what, uh, what we've been doing is looking at... Uh, when, you, when you think about sea level rise, um, there's um, the climate-induced aspect, which is, you know, the, which is sort of the melting of ice and land-based ice and the, the, and the thermal expansion of seawater, which means that the level of the ocean rises. But if you're living on the coast, um, if the sea rises, you don't actually know, is the sea rising or is the land sinking? And if you're at a local place, you've really got to take into account both effects. And what we find is in some of the big cities in Asia, and actually many of these deltas that I mentioned earlier in my uh, in the discussion, are actually sinking uh, quite significantly, and this is adding... So the climate effect is being reinforced by this 
thinking effect, Jakarta is probably the iconic city for this process at the current time. Tell us about the shocking case of Jakarta and then, of course, Tokyo as shocking cases of sinking cities. Well, Tokyo, um, Tokyo um, has subsided about four and a half metres, not the whole city. Um, the subsidence is really happening in those in, 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 in um, areas that are deltaic. And there's a delta around the port in the centre of, of Tokyo, and that sank four and a half metres. Um, so what's that? That's getting on for like 18 feet um, in the... Um, in, in, in the 20th century, um, and that area now is actually below sea level and is only land thanks to major major defences and, and, and pumping. But but in the case of Tokyo, they have actually stopped the subsidence by because the subsidence is caused by groundwater withdrawal. That's what causes it, and they've stopped the groundwater withdrawal. So they've removed the cause of the substance. They've protected the area, but the area now is very, very low-lying and very kind of quite vulnerable, but for the defences that have been put in. And how would you compare the global impacts of sinking cities with seas rising due to climate change? Is, is one sort of greater than the other in, in the millions of people that might be displaced eventually? Um, the, uh, well, at the, at the current time, our analysis shows that the effects of, of deltas and cities sinking is much bigger than actually climate-induced effects at the current time. So let's be clear on that. So what we're talking about now are observations of what's happening today. We estimated that relative sea level rise experienced by the average piece of coast is about 2.6 millimetres per year. If you are actually a coastal inhabitant, and, coastal, and people live in areas that tend to sink, you're experiencing rates three to four times higher than that, so maybe seven and a half to sort of ten in round terms uh, millimetres um, per, per year. So most of that effect is, sink, is the fact the land is sinking. As we go forward in time, um, climate-induced sea level rise is becoming bigger, and, and so the effects, the effects of climate change will grow and maybe become dominant in the long run. So, to my mind, they're both things you want to worry about because the net effect is the same. And you have led papers for the IPCC. What is the current official thinking on how much seas will rise by the year, say, 2050 or 2100? It depends on how, how closely we follow the, uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, so, if we, if we really don't, do anything about the Paris um, a, 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 a agreement, and, and we have sort of what you might call uncontrolled emissions, then um, certainly a metre rise by 2100 of climate-induced sea level rise is possible, and maybe even more. I mean, it's unlikely above a metre, but, but and, and right now the AR6 is actually looking at um, the, this, so there'll be new numbers coming out um, quite soon that will actually um, give some new numbers. So I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not actually aware of what those numbers will be. Um, if we follow, the, um, if we follow the, something nearer to the Paris Agreement, that will greatly reduce the amount of sea level rise down more to sort of something like, you know, 40 or 50 centimetres. So a substantial reduction. But it's interesting that even if we follow the Paris Agreement, sea levels don't stop rising. We simply slow the rate of rise. And I think one way I think about it is climate mitigation is necessary to make sea level rise manageable, but we'll still need to adapt to the residual rise that really is unstoppable now. Because of the warming we've had, we will see some sea level rise and we have to live with that and we have to adapt to that in some way. Well, the sea level is not stable, but neither is the land level on long time scales. Can you give us a case where sea level rise could be much worse than the global average because the land is sinking for other more natural reasons? Well, Jakarta, we, we already mentioned Jakarta. So Jakarta, um, the land is sinking, uh, you know, at in a sort of average rate of about 10 centimetres per year. That's a metre per decade. 10 metres per century, assuming that rate can continue, which it may not be able to continue. And that's due to the pumping of groundwater. So that's only at that one place, but clearly that's producing 
huge changes that should be avoided and and, and and I would advocate that there needs to be a lot of thought about how do we actually we talk about mitigating climate change and we should mitigate climate change we should also be thinking about mitigating subsidence and policies that try and reduce or even offset this you because you mentioned moving Jakarta to uh, Borneo well that's an extremely costly measure and could 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 they actually address the problem in Jakarta uh, uh, rather than move it? I mean, you know, I, I haven't worked there myself, but I'm just asking that question. And maybe for Jakarta it's too late, but there are many other cities in this case. So I think it's good that these cities get together, compare their experience and learn from each other, and I think hopefully come up with the best strategies for dealing with these problems. But I was really thinking of another force like New England, for example, that is sinking because formerly the weight of the glaciers that were there only 10 or 12,000 years ago had pushed that land up. But now that the glaciers are gone, the, the land is slowly sinking. It might make sea level rise in New England worse. Oh, sure. I mean, that, that's true. I mean, along the eastern seaboard of the United States, right down to the mid-Atlantic region in in you know, Chesapeake Bay and sort of Washington and Philadelphia, that area, the, um, the sea, the, the land is sinking for the, re for the reason that you just outlined. But the, the, the magnitude of that effect is, say, two millimeters per year. So it's, it's significant. Um, it makes things worse. It means that in, in places like um, Washington, uh, Annapolis, you're seeing maybe four millimeters of sea level rise per year under current conditions. Um, but there's not really anything we can actually do about that. We, can't, we can actually stop pumping groundwater and stop the city sinking with the situation you're describing um, to do with the ice sheets. Uh, then we have to just live with that and we have to adapt to it. We either have to build defences or we have to move or, or, or whatever the, the selected response is. Your new paper is a global analysis of substance, relative sea level change, and coastal flood exposure. That was published March 8, 2021, in the prestigious journal Nature Climate Change. Yes, we can show sinking cities in many countries, but really, Robert, when you add up these local impacts, does it matter on a global scale? Well, I think the whole point of the paper is yes, because we're saying the average, the average person in the coast is seeing three or four times the rate of relative sea level rise. Um, uh, and, and so the, 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 the substance effects are, are significant. They are happening in Pacific places, and there, there are certainly hot spots there, but it's happening quite widely, and, and many cities are affected, many deltas are affected, and many people are affected. So I think it brings out, it's often considered just a local problem, I would think it's, it's really a global problem. Um, back, to the, back to why we care about sea level. Why should people who are not at the coast care about sea level rise, as you posed at the beginning? Well, uh, the same, for the same reason, we should care about these, these cities that are sinking. And it's probably in everybody's interest to deal with these problems. We have the Sendai Agreement to, 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 to do with natural hazards, um, which is, trying to, which is trying, to, um, trying to mitigate sort of disaster risk. And uh, this is one cause of disaster risk. People like the World Bank and others who fund development in these areas, they're, they're, they're often saying we should be thinking about our exposure to climate change. I would think they should also be thinking about their exposure to substance and relative sea level rise due to substance as well. And so that gives the kind of some examples, I think, of these bigger picture reasons of why we should be concerned. And also, I think leaving cities to their own devices um, doesn't help to find the best solutions. If we recognize it as a shared problem, we can start talking about it, we can learn from each other, share experience, and probably come up with better solutions together. I noticed that Portsmouth, for example, in the UK, has had higher seas but actually lower flooding events because they've come up with portable water gates and other solutions. And I'm reminded, too, of how heat deaths in some cities have gone down, even though there are more heat waves because they've instituted uh, cooling centers and so on. And my point is that adaptation may actually cover up some of the impacts of climate change for a while until the problems become too large for what we can afford to do anything about or what we can really do anything about? Um, I wouldn't say... I, I think found that 
the way you present it may be a little bit kind of um, negative in the sense I think adaptation is always adaptation is not about a permanent solution. I think adaptation in the, I meant I made the point that sea levels will continue to rise, so it's a long term challenge, and um, I think that um, with adaptation measures we we we, we are always making a decision about how to deal with a problem for a 50 or a 100 year sort of time frame or whatever maybe maybe it's shorter than that um but then um we bequeath the problem i mean coastal hazards exist today coastal hazards have existed in the past um and um then then then, then it's for then it's for future generations to sort of to think about how they might solve the future problems um so but i but i but i I take your point i mean it's worthwhile thinking about the long-term consequences of these of of these problems but um but but i but i i don't think about covering up i think we need to manage them for a time frame and um and then you know and then think um but, but i don't think we can ever find permanent solutions to these problems i think we i think we are managing them for a for a time period, and you might think about we're on an adaptation, we're on a sort of pathway, we're on a journey, and um, a- and what's the best journey that we should we should take would be kind of the question I would pose, um, and that's maybe the a question that coastal societies should be thinking about. You are listening to Professor Robert Nichols on Radio EcoShock. He knows where and why the ocean is threatening land that is home to millions of people. You know, Robert, wealthy cities like New York or London can build floodgates and tide gates to stop the, the highest, highest surges, but although I notice New York has not done so, even though Hurricane Sandy flooded lower Manhattan. Have you collected a sort of list of cities who are adapting well and those who are less so? Well, I mean, I think the cities like the, 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 the kind of the hot spots for good adaptation really are, you say, London. Well, it depends what you mean by good adaptation. Well, certainly in Europe, um, London, um, Amsterdam, uh, Rotterdam, Hamburg, I mean, cities around the Southern North Sea, which have had a long history of flooding and um, actually in the 20th century, significant floods and deaths, not necessarily in, in, in the Netherlands, actually, but in, in, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, but nearby, um, they are really taking this issue um, very seriously and planning for it. Um, I think that, that that experience is spreading more widely now. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a much greater awareness of it. A city like Singapore, I think, now is also, um, also um, preparing for these issues. And I think many of the cities in China and, and Japan are also um, thinking, thinking about it. But clearly, many cities around the world... Um, at the present time, are still thinking fairly short term. I think to think about sea level rise, you're often thinking 50 years, 100 years into the future in 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 your planning um, to 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 really be ready for these um, changes. You mentioned China, and you know they've actually expanded land into the sea. They've filled in an amazing amount. You can see it from satellite. And so I wonder how they're going to fare as the shoreline inevitably moves inland into China. Well, I'm, I, I wouldn't. I mean, there's a huge Asia is an area where there's been a huge amount of land claim over the last 30 years. If you, to be honest with you, every coastal city in the world, including in the United States and Canada, has has advanced into the sea, even if it's just the dock areas. You, you, I mean, around New York, for example, I've seen maps produced by people at Columbia University that show how New York has advanced out and areas that were marshes have been filled in, etc. And that's, that happens pretty much in every single city around the world because co- land becomes expensive in cities, so you, you, you tend to take it. Um, in, in, the, in, in Asia, they're doing it a lot now. I think um, you, by building that land, obviously that new land is vulnerable to sea level rise. And so I think that the, the lesson that's learned is that you need to be anticipating sea level rise if you're going to continue doing that. And so, for example, I know in Singapore, so not, not China, in Singapore, if they, if they claimed new land in future, they would actually do it to a higher level than they did in the past. So they, they're, they're, they're factoring in 
sea level rise into their plans already, and I think they would build that land about a metre higher. So back to my own... So they're, again, it's not a permanent solution, but they're buying, they're buying a good bit of time. Sea level rise doesn't make this policy... Um, it doesn't mean you stop doing this. It should change how you do it, if you do it. All right. For our American listeners, where are some of the hot spots for coastal change in the United States? Well, I mean, I think the uh, Louisiana is um, really the place where the Mississippi Delta, really, I suppose, you know, but it's also the state of Louisiana. Um, you have um, basically in New Orleans, um, sea levels are rising at about six millimeters. Or, well, the city, sorry, is sinking at six millimeters um, per year. And, the, and in fact, the whole Delta plane is sinking at that kind of amount. So that's that's sort of double what the sea is rising, uh, the rate at which the sea is rising, because it's about nine, nine millimetres or, or maybe almost between friends, a centimetre per year of rise. And there's a huge area of land being lost. Um, people say a football pitch is lost every, every 15 minutes um, in Louisiana. Um, I'm not sure that's true anymore, but certainly that's a figure I remember uh, in the past. I'm not up to date with the current rates of loss. Um, but but there's, there's very large changes going on going on there. Another region, I think, which is also a hot spot, but less less so, is the Mid Atlantic. I, we talked earlier how um, the land is sinking in in some parts of the eastern United States, and particularly between sort of New York and Virginia, um, it, 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 it's happening at quite rapid rates. And so you found, find, for example, around the Chesapeake Bay that there are quite significant um, erosion and loss of land um, going on. So I'd say those are probably the two hotspots. And then Louisiana goes on into Texas. Places like Galveston are also um, seeing issues um, around, around um, sub ex exacerbated sea level rise because the land is sinking. Well, should we worry that this problem will affect food production in an ever more crowded world? I think we should be concerned about it. I have been doing work in Bangladesh, um, and we've been looking at the future of actually agriculture in coastal Bangladesh. If you look at some of the early papers um, they, and sea level rise, they show a huge area of Bangladesh going under with a one-metre rise in sea level. When you work in the real landscape and take into account um, what's there today, actually there are very large numbers of um, defences. There's 5,000 kilometres of, of embankments in Bangladesh uh, and, and, and hundreds of, more than 100 polders exist, you know, like, as you have in the Netherlands. So you have, you, have, you have dikes and then you have land behind where the agriculture happens. And when we look at that in our analysis, we find um, agri if we did not, if we did things badly, agriculture could really decline. Equally, if we have scenarios um, that include likely improvements in plant breeding, things like that, maybe agricultural production could rise. So I don't think it's just about sea level rise. It also comes back to this issue of adaptation. So um, I think, in fact, the coastal future is, is complicated, really. I mean, it's going to depend on multiple things uh, and how they interact, what, what's the outcome. Well, maybe it's a King Canute situation. We cannot order the sea to be stable. Do you see yourself now more and more as an advocate for preparation and and adaptation? Well, I think, sir, well, really, I mean, I think I've come to this issue from the perspective of adaptation, really. My interest was always to understand what are the impacts of sea level rise and what, as a society, can we do about it? Um, and so I think definitely, I think that we should be around the world planning for climate-induced sea level rise. Also, these problems of subsidence that we've discussed today. I mean, again, they're not so... That, that the importance of those varies from place to place. But where this matters, we should be thinking about that. And if you look at London, for example, they have come up with something called the Thames Estuary 2100 project. And that thinks through... How could London deal with a sea level rise up to five metres? doesn't ask when that will happen. It just says, let's imagine sea level rises. What options are available to us? Now, there's, they didn't really evaluate moving London very much in the analysis. 
that's obviously an option on the table, <laughs> uh, implicit in what you're doing. And they, 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 they looked at the options to keep London where it is. And this costs £15 million, pounds, so quite a lot of money. So what's that, £20 million US dollars or whatever? But it means that policymakers can really understand um, the choices they face with adaptation. And they've, the decision really is in London, they can protect against one, two, three metres of sea level rise. The options are there. They seem to be affordable. And, that, and that's the basis of planning. Now, in other places, maybe you would think you would want to retreat. But it, even if you want to retreat, you ought to be thinking about that today and not waiting for the storm that pushes you back. I, I, so I would be encouraging proactive planning to really be coming up with approaches that we feel can be sustained over the coming decades and longer so that we can have prosperous, healthy, vibrant societies in our coastal areas. And from your experience, does it take disaster to get governments going to protect their coasts? Well, I think you, you do hit on a good point. I mean... Certainly, a, 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 a hurricane or superstorm, superstorm Sandy or a hurricane Katrina in, in Louisiana, these events um, shape how we manage our coasts. And, um, and certainly, they bring home the fact that there's a problem. Uh, that's unfortunate, and I suppose one of my, one of my um, kind of passions, really, is to try and... Uh, get people to be more proactive uh, and in a, react really to virtual disasters that we might simulate in a computer rather than real ones. But unfortunately, human beings do seem to react and put the political process does seem to react, um, still seems to oft sometimes need real events to actually trigger um, action. All right, we're about to wrap up, but I have to ask you, with your experience, do you think that we are in kind of a lag time for climate action because of the pandemic, because of the economic threats that, that we face? Have we, have we set it on the back burner? Because that really would worry me, because nothing in these natural processes from the ice melt and, and the heating has stopped. It's all still going, and, and, but we're not. Well, I, I think clearly the, the, the last year has has been, uh, you know, other issues have been more to the fore. Um, I mean, I've worked at home for the last 12 months, which is something I, uh, I never really suspect, never really expected in a million years. If you, if you told me um, a little bit before, that's what would have happened. Um, but um, I think, you know, people are preparing. The COP26 will be happening in Glasgow um, in, the, in the autumn in the UK. Uh, and we're, we're, we're making lots of preparations for that. I think it's, as I have said already, I think it's very important that we mitigate climate change to try and reduce sea level down to manageable levels. So I think there's still a lot of urgency there, and I think many people are still pushing on that. And I think it's important to keep on reminding people of these challenges. And I think in the coastal zone, it's, not, it, it, it's dealing with sea level rise and climate change. And also the other problems, so the substance issue we've mentioned as well, we, we also want to be dealing with that so that we, as I say, give a, give a coastal zone for the future that, is, that people want to live in and can have prosperous and healthy lives. Our guest has been Professor Robert J. Nichols. You can find links to his new paper in Nature Climate Change and other information and materials, a couple of his YouTube videos in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. Robert, thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with us. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock.